My name's Anne-Marie Glennie. I'm um, an editor with the Cochrane Oral Health Group. So my angle on this presentation is from a, a systematic reviewer. And Judith works with NICE, so her, her angle coming from a guideline developer's perspective. Um, Judith hopefully will chip in along the way if I um, go off, off um, a slide or what have you. So, Okay, our brief was to, to discuss what trialists can do to ensure their research is most useful to, to those that are involved in evidence synthesis, be that systematic review um, or, or guidelines. So what I want to focus on today is, is really issues around the reporting of health-related trials and focusing on, on three main areas, the publication of trials, the reporting of the methods within trials and um, selective outcome reporting or outcome reporting bias. I'm quite happy to take questions along the way, so if you want to stop and discuss anything along the way, and that, that's um, more than welcome. I'm just going to start with um, an overview of the systematic review process. I'm not going into this in any great detail, but just to kind of show you the steps we go through um, when we undertake a systematic review. You start off with your hopefully clinically relevant well-formulated question. We do a comprehensive search of the data where we try and get um, English language articles, non-English language articles, published, unpublished um, articles and so on, so that we're getting as much data as we can. We undergo um, a rigorous selection and data um, extraction process. All the included studies will undergo some kind of risk of bias assessment. So we're looking to see how well those studies have been conducted. And that then at the end is the, the synthesis of data, whether that's a qualitative or, or a quantitative synthesis. And I guess the three areas that I'm going to focus on mainly today are problems we might have at the data search phase, risk of bias, and the synthesis of data. Um, so when we're undertaking the comprehensive data search, I've mentioned we try and identify both published and unpublished data, and that's because um, there's something called publication bias, I'm sure most of you are aware. There's empirical evidence to show that positive results or results that are statistically significant are more likely to be published than negative results. Okay, so if we're only including published data within our reviews, then we're going to be getting an overestimation of, of treatment effect. And, um, so there's a lot of empirical evidence out there. And more recently, um, Sally Hopewell and colleagues have looked at publication bias and, and shown that the odds of a trial getting published are about four times more likely if they've got significant, a statistically significant result um, rather than non-statistically significant results. And I want to illustrate how, how important it is that we're, we're actually in, including this unpublished data. Um, early, uh, it was last year actually, a systematic review of reboxetine, which is a third generation um, antidepressant used for the treatment of acute depression, um, was published in the BMJ. And this was the first system systematic review of this drug that it tried to identify both published and unpublished data. And they went to, to extreme lengths to actually get hold of the un unpublished data to include within their systematic review. And actually 74% of the patient data was previously unpublished. So um, although there were other systematic reviews out there of this drug, they were only looking at a fraction of the, of the evidence. The results, the conclusions from the systematic review were that reboxetine is overall, overall it's an ineffective and potentially harmful antidepressant. Mm -hmm. And this actually contradicted the systematic reviews that were already out there. Okay, so it was just showing that actually if we're just relying on published data, we're getting quite a skewed um, conclusion. And there's some argument, um, there's some debate at the moment as to whether we still have all the unpublished data. So this might just be kind of the tip of the iceberg with this. Um, what was happening in, in the reviews that looked at just the published data is that you were getting an overestimation of the efficacy and an un underestimation of the harm associated with the drug. So one thing that's um, been championed really for, for trying to overcome some of this issue of publication bias is that all, all clinical trials should be registered at protocol stage. So they should be registered prospectively. So we know if we're, if we're carrying out a systematic review, we know which trials have been started in our particular area, which trials are being undertaken. 
Um, and one of the first trial registers to um, come into play was clinicaltrials.gov. Um, I think it was established in 1999 in, in the States. And more recently, there was the US FDA Amendment Act in 2007 that stated not only did the protocols of, of the trials have to be um, published on this database, but also the basic results of, of the trials. So although that's been going on for a long time, there are loopholes with these registers. It, um, it's the FDA, uh, it's, only, it's only up to drugs that are regulated by the FDA. And despite um, widespread sort of pushing for getting um, trials registered and the, the de Declaration of Helsinki states every clinical trial must be registered in a publicly accessible database before recruitment of the first subject. Um, the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors have embraced the whole issue of trials reg registration and they will only publish trials that have um, registered their protocols before the enrolment of, of participants. Despite all of the, these issues, trial registration still isn't, like, you know, isn't universally accepted or, or um, undertaken. And um, it's estimated that about 50% of trials supporting drugs that are approved by the FDA remain unpublished five years after drug approval. So even with trial registration going on in, in the States, it still, doesn't, um, it still doesn't address the issue of publication bias fully. If I move on to another aspect of, of evidence synthesis uh, where we have problems, it's risk of bias assessment. Um, bias is basically, it's determining the extent to which the results of a study can be, can be believed. How, how much can we trust the findings? And we should note at this stage that a study can, can be conducted to the highest standard for, the, for that particular um, setting, but it can still have a risk of bias. So blinding is obviously hugely important in clinical trials, but there will be some trials where it's just not feasible. Um, and it might be a very, very well conducted trial for that particular research question, but there will still be issues regarding bias. And what we're trying to do within our evidence sy synthesis is look at the potential uh, direction of the bias, you know, is it going to cause an overestimation or an underestimation of effect, and what, what's the magnitude of the bias. And certainly within, within Cochrane reviews, um, the sources of bias in trials that we address are typically the sequence generation, so how has randomization occurred within the trial? How has the random sequencing generated? You know, is it um, computer generated, random number table, um, coin toss, and so on? Concealment of allocation, so how have the, the participants actually been allocated to the groups, and has that allocation been, that allocation been concealed from all involved until the patients are actually registered within a particular treatment arm? Um, blinding of participant personnel outcome assessors, incomplete outcome data, so how have they addressed um, dropouts, withdrawals, is there an imbalance in the dropouts across arms and so on, and selective outcome reporting. Um, I should say at this point, um, systematic, the, the issues that, folk, that are problematic for us as systematic reviewers lead on to be problems for guideline developers because ideally systematic reviews should be the building blocks of, of guidelines. Um, when we're doing the risk of bias assessment, within systematic reviews now, there's, a, there's um, a call for us to just focus the analysis and the summary of findings on studies that are seen to be at low risk of bias. Okay, And within guidelines, the strength of recommendations they place on the evidence is li linked to the assessment of the risk of bias. But that actually causes, causes some problems. This is a figure that's been taken from a systematic review of um, interventions for treating, for preventing mucositis in patients that are having cancer treatment. And there are 131 trials within this review. And this is um, a typical risk of bias figure taken from a Cochrane review. And it's basically showing that um, all the green patches are where the trials have been assessed as um, being at low risk of bias, the red indicates high risk of bias, and the yellow is unclear risk of bias. And as you can see in the 130 odd trials, um, over 75% of them were unclear with regard to their reporting of um, sequence generation, allocation, concealment, 
and so on. Now, these might be very well conducted studies, but we don't know. Um, the reporting is so poor, we, we can't make a judgment. But it then means that our, our recommendations with regard to, to guidelines or our interpretation of the evidence within the systematic review is downplaying all this evidence that might be very good quality evidence, but because it's been poorly reported, we can't include it in, in, um, in the analysis. It's not just linked to mucositis. This was from another review we were involved in, looking at radiotherapy for the treatment of um, oral cancer. And again, it typically seems to be ar around issues with, uh, with regard to randomization, which you think, in, if it comes up to you in RCT, it's quite, I think it's because people, I don't think people mean to leave it out, it's just perhaps they think it's obvious or, um, but without that information being there, it's very hard to make an assessment on the quality of, of the study. Um, other areas where we have problems are incomplete outcome data. So they don't tell us, you can't find out what's happened to all the people that have been recruited. We lose people along the way and we don't know why. So, um, one way of trying to overcome this is the consort statement, which has been around for several years now and has been adopted by, by many journals. And it's basically a minimum set of um, recommendations for reporting randomised control trials. And it has been shown, there's been some empirical work to show that if people follow these, these guidelines, then the reporting is improved. Um, it's just one of a set of, of um, standards. There are checklists, not just for RCTs, but across all kinds of observational studies, diagnostic accuracy studies, and so on. Um, the problem with it is that even in journals that say they, they've adopted it, they still don't always adhere to it. So you'll still see randomised control trials in journals that say they've adopted the consort statement, but don't necessarily report on, on all the relevant items. But if, if studies were reporting on all of these, it would make um, the evidence synthesis process so much easier. If I move on to the, the third section, which is the synthesis of data, and here I'm going to be focusing really on meta-analysis, which is the statistical um, combination of results from two or more studies. And the advantages we have of doing a meta-analysis is that we're increasing our power and our precision around our estimate of effect. Um, so it, it gives us the ability to answer questions not posed by the individual studies as well. The problem with it is that people quite often go ahead and do meta-analyses when, when they shouldn't, you know, when perhaps the, the studies are heterogeneous, they're, they're the, the differences in the characteristics of the studies are just too different to, to call the studies. Um, they should only really be done as well if you're measuring the same outcome. It might be on different scales, but it's fundamentally the same outcome. And where you have the, the, the data from the studies. And this is, it's these bottom two that cause us a lot of problems, really, and have um, caused the potential for selective outcome reporting or um, outcome reporting bias. And this is defined as selection on the basis of the results of of a subset of analysis to be reported, uh, of a subset of analysis to be reported, and there are lots of different ways it might occur. So, selective omission of outcomes for report. So, it's the trialists writing up, and they may have addressed um, five outcomes, but they only report on two of them. Those are going to be the two that are showing a, a significant result, most likely. Um, selective choice of data for an outcome. So, are they just picking certain time points? You know, again, are those the time points that are showing significant effect or not? Um, selective reporting of analyses using the same data. So you can analyse data in lots of different ways, and ideally you should be um, setting out your analysis plan in your protocol and sticking to it, or, or justifying why you've changed it. But quite often analyses might be done in lots of different ways, um, so it's kind of like data dredging. Selective reporting of subsets of the data, so you might just be using certain subscales of a full measurement scale. So get, again, it's kind of manipulation of the data. And selective under-reporting of data. Now, this happens a lot um, within, within studies where they might report that um, a result is statistically significant, but they don't give you the data. So you can't actually, as, as a systematic reviewer or a guideline developer, you can't really use the data. Um, for those of you that are interested in, in writing up or, or involved in writing up clinical trials, in Chad and Altman um, in the BMJ, there was quite a nice 
table that just shows you the sort of like basic data you should be providing for different types of um, data. So unpaired continuous data, unpaired binary, paired binary, and so on. It just gives you the, the basics you need um, to, to put in your study. Now, it's direct, again, direct ev empirical evidence to show that selective reporting bias does exist. Um, and the reasons for not reporting outcomes where well, it might be deliberate, it might be that people are just wanting to show significant results or not, or it might be that they, they think that the other results just aren't clinically important. Um, and potentially with journal restrictions on article word count, or, although nowadays we think this is becoming less of an issue because so many journals allow you to have supplementary material online. So um, hopefully that will become less of an issue. Um, just to illustrate um, how we found it to be an issue in one of our reviews, going back to the mucositis review, so it's looking at prevention of mucositis for people having cancer treatment, and we identified 131 trials, 13 of those we couldn't actually use in a meta-analysis because they didn't provide um, enough data. So there was only, we could only include them in sort of like a, a narrative because there wasn't any data there we could use in a statistical analysis. But only, perhaps more alarmingly, only 37% of them were deemed to be free of selective reporting bias. Most of them were only using subsets of data for severe mucositis for the grade, uh, greater than two, rather than giving us all the information on mucositis um, for the patients being assessed. There's been another study by Smith et al. Um, from Liverpool where they were comparing protocols um, of trials with subsequent publications and looking at the outcomes that were presented in the protocols and then obviously in the full publication. And then they did a follow-up interview, telephone interview, with the trialists themselves. And in 29% of those trials that they looked at, there was, again, evidence of outcome reporting bias. And, and quite often it was because the trialists, I don't think, they weren't really appreciating the impact it had on the evidence. They weren't trying to mislead. It was just they were reporting what they felt was of interest. Um, another example, um, this was a study done um, in the States. It was looking at trials of gabapentin for off-label indications. And gabapentin is Pfizer, isn't it? Pfizer and Park Davis um, are the manufacturers of gabapentin. And the authors of the study were able to identify 20 um, internal documents, it, internal documents for 20 trials, 12 of which had been reported in, in publications, or full publications. But in eight of these 12 primary, uh, eight of these 12 trials, the primary outcome defined in the published report actually differed from that that was in the internal protocol. And they differed in different ways, but perhaps with an introduction of a new primary outcome, um, failure to distinguish between primary and secondary outcomes within the study, relegation of a primary outcome to a secondary outcome, and failure to report one or more of the protocol-defined primary outcomes. And we know that when we're carrying out trials, things do change along the way, but perhaps there should be some process by which we can justify those changes and um, ensure they're recorded along the way, so that it doesn't get to the stage where we're just picking and choosing um, outcomes at the time of publication. From, from the studies they looked at, trials that had non-significant, non-statistically um, significant results for protocol-defined primary outcomes in the internal documents, so in the 20 internal documents, were the ones that were unlikely to be reported in full or were to be reported with a changed primary outcome. So again, it's that whole thing of just publishing positive results. Okay. Um, this has huge impact on, on the evidence synthesis. It's going to distort um, our estimates of effect, either overestimate or underestimate, and most typically, again, it's overestimating efficacy and underestimating harms. Um, it's going to influence development of recommendations, and it has been a, a big problem for NICE with the development of um, some of their guidelines. And if I go back to the Roboxetine example, um, there are NICE guidelines on the use of Roboxetine, um, we've already discussed the fact that the, the systematic review published in the BMJ last year was looking at published and unpublished data. 
But even within the published data, three of the studies, so three out of eight published articles, had evidence of outcome reporting bias. And actually within the NICE guidelines, in the full text, their recommendation is that Roboxetine is superior to placebo and as effective as other antidepressants in the treatment of depression. Yet actually when we look at the, the updated review that includes all the unpublished data, we're seeing that, we're seeing that it's actually potentially harmful. It's ineffective and potentially harmful. So we can end up with really skewed um, recommendations unless we're, we have access to all the data. And I know um, Iding and, and colleagues, it, it, was, it was quite a task to actually get hold of all the data, and it shouldn't be such a task. You know, this should be data that's publicly available. At, at NICE, as Joe touched that, is that we were obviously limited by time and money and resources. Um, we, we don't have the time to get unpublished data. We only literally use what is published. We, we haven't got the time to sort all that through to the Dimitri. So sometimes we know the data is missing, but you, you can't do it. You can't have the time to do it. Maybe it's kind of a contradiction in the, in the results and the review. Um, one new initiative for trying to overcome the selective outcome reporting is something called COMET, which is looking at core outcome measures and effectiveness trials. And this is being undertaken with Paul, by Paula Williamson across in Liverpool. Um, yeah, and it, it's stipulating which outcomes should be useful in clinical trials. And it's basically setting out a minimum set of outcomes. They're trying to get a database together of minima, minimum outcomes that should be reported in different healthcare settings. Um, the advantages are less heterogeneity between trials, reduced risk of outcome reporting bias, and potentially the use of more, more appropriate outcome measures. Another key initiative really is data sharing. Should we be sharing the actual data sets of clinical trials that are being undertaken? And um, the International Stroke Trials Database, has, they've, they've made their database publicly available. Um, they think it will facilitate the planning of future trials and permit additional secondary analyses. I know there's some dispute over whether people are happy to, to share such data. And um, I know in Nature there was some there have been some editorials on pre-publication and post-publication data sharing. Um, so that's perhaps something we can discuss. So, so to summarise, basically, unfortunately, published biomedical literature seems to represent a selected uh, a selective and biased data set. And really, it should be the responsi but the social responsibility of all those involved in trials to publish honestly, transparently, and in full. And perhaps ways of, of encouraging this are the consort statement, uh, comet, data sharing, and, and legislation, I think, with regard to trials registration. Um, we've talked about F, um, clinicaltrials.gov and, and the FDA. There's a similar initiative in Europe the data implementation isn't yet clear, but perhaps this is the way to go, that we need legislation to ensure that all clinical trials are being um, registered prior to the recruitment of, of patients. Thank you very much. I'll leave my website, my um, email address up if people wanted um, copies of any of the references.